hello, hello. And thank you for joining us for our new Conch Shell Productions live stream artist chat. Today is September 3rd, 2020, and we're happy to have you here. My name is Magali Colleyman Christopher. I'm the founder and artistic director of Conch Shell Productions and the co-host for tonight's chat. If you've joined us for live online events in the past, thank you, thank you, and welcome back. If not, if you're new to Conch Shell Productions, let me tell you a little bit about us. Our mission is to develop, produce new plays written by Caribbean American and Caribbean diaspora writers, as well as bringing attention to the emerging voices of our artistic community, hence the artist chat. Allow me to introduce you to a Conch Shell Productions literary manager, Sergey Burbank, who will be co-hosting tonight with me, or today, depending on where you are, right? Right. <laughs> Hello. Uh, today, dar today's Artist Chat guests will be discussing their journey as multi-hyphenate performing artists. So before we get to the chat, allow me to introduce you to Juliet Jeffers. So Juliet joins us from Los Angeles, California. She is an award-winning Caribbean, act Caribbean American actor, writer, director, producer, and teaching artist. On screen, she has appeared in 18 films, 35 guest star TV roles, and over 60 national commercials. Some of her notable TV credits include Chicago Med, Snowfall, Criminal Minds, and Grey's Anatomy. Her theater highlights include five award-winning solo plays that she wrote and performed, Batman and Robin in the Boogie Down, Chocolate Match, Pan Gule, Judgment Day, and Tio Pablo. As a teaching artist, Juliet teaches acting and writing to inmates in correctional facilities and to youth in the LA area. She is a private coach and has helped develop and direct numerous solo shows. And she also serves as an advisory board member of the LA Women's Theater Festival. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Evan Park. So Evan is an actor, writer, producer, and media entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in the entertainment industry. He has been a principal performer in over a dozen feature films, including the Academy Award winning productions of the Cider House Rules, and Django Unchained. His other film credits include King Kong, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and the recent Netflix romantic comedy hit Set It Up. Evan has performed over 150 episodes of television, including such titles as Alias, NCIS New Orleans, The Get Down, The Blacklist, and Power. On stage, he has been a principal performer both on and off Broadway. In gaming, he has played the role of Hayes in King Kong, Luther in Detroit Becomes Human. Currently, Evan is recurring on the second season of Kevin Williamson's Tell Me a Story. Recently, he also co-created, wrote, and produced The Other Side, a podcast produced for the Yale Podcast Network on iTunes. Evan is also the founder of Arimathea Media Capital Incorporated a media content company that highlights the voices and perspectives of people in color and people of faith in content that appeals to the global marketplace. He has worked extensively in lay ministry and various capacities, which has included community organizing and co-founding a ministry outreach initiative in Los Angeles, California. He holds a BA in economics from Cornell University, as well as both an MFA and a Master's of Divinity from Yale University. Welcome, you, welcome. Hey. I'd like to follow up with Tanya Perez. Tanya Perez is an award-winning Latinx actress, writer, and producer based in New York City. Her acting resume includes film and television roles on amazing shows like Orange is New Black, Jessica Jones, Blue Bloods, Madame Secretary, and Hal Hartley's Ned Rifle opposite Parker Posey. On stage, her most notable appearances are in Seattle Rep's production of Anna in the Tropics, Sonia Flew, at both CATF and Laguna Playhouse, and her sold out solo show at the Downtown Urban Theater Festival at the Cherry Lane Theater. Her short, Veronica, won 2018 Best Actress at Story Mode Festival, 
Story Mode Short Festival, Best Screenplay and Best Actress at Atlanta Con, and Best Latinx Short at Indie Fest. Recently, her, Tanya has voiced Bibi in the critically acclaimed YA podcast Time Storm Season 2, played Melosha in readings of Juan Ramirez Jr.'s play Calling Puerto Rico, and played Beatrice op opposite Sean Caraval in the Parsnip, Parsnip Ship's haunting re recording of Desi Moreno Pension's play Devil Land. Most recently played, she most recently played Jade Santiago in Christine Eve Cato's play The Good Cop for Conchell Productions Reset Series. Thank you for joining us, Tanya. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Monique A. Robinson. You may have seen her in our Hear Her Call Caribbean American Theater Festival this year. Monique is a multi-hyphenated art artivist. Listen to that, artivist and healer who uses the art of storytelling as a way to hold space for others. As a daughter of superhero parents, a father who was a community organizer and church leader, reared in the Jim Crow South, and an immigrant Jamaican mother of three with a BA and working on her master's, Monique inherited a legacy of faith, resilience, integrity, and hard work. Monique has performed in New York City's off-Broadway theaters and in regional theaters. Her on-screen work can be seen on Netflix, TV Land, and CBS All Access. Monique received her BA in theater and government at Smith College and an MFA in acting from the Professional Actor Training Program at the University of Washington. She's a co-founder of Neek Works Entertainment LLC and is an award-winning, which is an award-winning entertainment company dedicated to using the power of provocative and passionate theater and filmmaking to provide a forum to address issues of social injustice, spirituality, and representation of the Black experience across genres. Welcome, Monique. Snap, snap to everybody. Snap, snap, snap. Okay, so, <laughs> so you, you saw the topic for tonight, right? Multi-hyphenate. And some of you may have been like, what's that? What's that? It's actually a word. It is actually a word, and if you go to the Cambridge English Dictionary, you'll find that they say that a multi-hyphenate is someone with several professional skills, professions or skills, especially in the entertainment industry. And if you listen to all these bios, you got it, right? They've got several skills, several professionals. So we're going to start off tonight with one question. And anyone who wants to jump in can tell me, we already got a little piece of Monique's perspective on that answer, but let's say that we start off with, what aspects of your upbringing as a Caribbean American do you feel most contributed to you evolving into this amazing multi-hyphenate artist? Well, I can start by saying that I think <laughs> The definition of a West Indian is you have to have 13 jobs. <laughs> 13! <laughs> <laughs> or you're a lazy life again. So I think it's in our nature to do various things. I know for me, my, my parents instilled discipline and productivity. My mother would wake me up, you know, my brother and I, you know, and she would sing, wakey, wakey, wakey. <laughs> Even if it's like on a Saturday and we're, you know what I mean? And so she'd be like, she'd open the blinds and she'd sing to us. And it's like, what are you going to do today? You know? So I, I had, of course, as a kid, I was like, ah, but I'm so grateful for that because I have such a great work ethic and, and discipline. And, and that's from my West Indian upbringing, Caribbean. Thank you. Anyone else? Honey, I was going to say live in color, and no, I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> live in color, they used to have this skit about Jamaicans having a whole lot of jobs. But you know what's mm -hmm. funny? Um, I, I, similar to what Juliet said, I think for me, it's just my parents too. They, they know, depending on when, what generation you are sometimes, if you're first generation, uh, it didn't matter what your parents did before they got here. They had to come here, and they had to hustle a lot of times. Mm -hmm. They were a lot younger. Then, then we were, my parents were, were young. My dad came here. You already have 
four kids when he was here, came here. And my mom, you know, had two of those mm-hmm. four. And then there was another one coming a couple of years later, right? So they came here and they had to re-educate themselves. And so in a lot of ways, um, uh, you know, just the, for me, it's been just what your parents modeled, you know, no excuses. Um, mm-hmm. they, didn't, they didn't have excuses about anything. They did what they needed to do. At one point, my father said that when he came here, he was a police officer uh, in Jamaica. Anybody from Jamaica, he was a constable, right? in Jamaica, but he came here and had to do two security jobs and go to school. He had the opportunity to be in NYPD, but he didn't want to do it. And because he had, he did, he was a pretty good cop. He was a, he did special services kind of thing in Jamaica. And so when he came here, there was a high up NYPD who said, look, when you who came down there, and said, when you come up, we'll get you in. But he had to, with four kids, um, have two security jobs. He probably didn't pay that much in the, in the seventies and go to school while my mother was going to school and, and working. So I've seen that since I got here. So I think they were just, they did what they had to do and they didn't make excuses. So for us, I think that hyphen, that multi hyphen really represented the portfolio of things that we do to, to, to achieve what we set out to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I was amazed when they said people in, in entertainment, I'm like entertainment. <laughs> We've been doing multi-hyphenates forever. Entertainment. <laughs> Anyone else wants to share? I'll share. I, um, you know, similar to Evan's path and what he's ta- speaking about, you know, watching my family. Um, we left the, um, we left New York um, when I was in early, um, you know, in the early 80s. Um, and I was a kid. So, you know, they basically got an opportunity to, buy a plot of land, buy a house and live that American dream. Mm. And watching that, you know, really meant that there was a lot of sacrifice to that, that they had to, um, you know, they had to work um, extremely hard. And, and it was at that time, it was about assimilation. So, you know, we grew up um, in a very Southern way. And, um, and I felt like, you know, my, my experience um, as a young Latina, as a passing Latina, um, white passing Latina, um, afforded me some uh, privilege, but also there was a lot of uh, racism that we had to fight growing up. Mm. And I think that, um, and through seeing how my family dealt with it um, and dealt with it with grace and dealt with it with, um, with, Mm -hmm. Uh, a kind of power um, that I feel like both my sister and I, you know, as we have been able to, um, you know, live our lives in a certain way, it was really something that I feel like um, at, at one time, at, I think about it, like I was 18, it was really when I was just like, we, di- we didn't know enough of our heritage. Um, and it was now my time to go out and seek it. And once I unlocked that, I unlocked more of what my family was. My whole family's um, down in Florida. So it was really like, you know, we had, to, we had to be a certain way until now it feels like it's okay to really explore that um, our Puerto Rican roots, our, our, um, our African roots, uh, all of those things and bring that to the little ones and share it. And I think that's one of the things for me as an artist, it was, it was really the day that I decided to go ahead and say, I need to explore is when I felt like I came into my own as an artist. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do that. Just um, waiting for somebody to do it. Exactly. And you'd hire me for that. I was going to go ahead and do it. I was going to become the writer. I was going to write these stories. I was going to write and fail. I was going to write and fail, but I wanted to do it as, as the producer, as the writer, as the director, as the actress, and then stepping away from that because I realized after a couple of years of being in the multi-hyphenate, and really understanding that how many stories need to be told, not right. just from me, but from the people around me, um, really made me feel like, okay, now I can go ahead and step back and and kind of just be the the director for a little bit instead of taking on all those things. Are you are you able to do it? Are you really sticking to that? Are you kind of like feeling yourself I try. coming back? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 nice when I'm on a project now and it's just like I'm I'm only hired for this. 
right, and right, I have to right. turn off that brain. And I go, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to turn you off and I'm going to relax for a second. Beautiful. Monique. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that you're from Florida. I'm also South Floridian. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that, uh, as everyone said, being Jamaican, the 13 job thing was the consistent <laughs> thing. And I, w I always was brought up with you keep nine irons in the fire. Hmm. You never know which one, always working on something. But I would say I was reared by multi-hyphenates. And it, it may not have been the classical sense of, of artists or actors, but my mother and my father were storytellers. They always had uh, something creative to do. If it was in reading the Bible to us, we were um, being told stories about Jamaica or what it was like in, in Florida and different times and seeing them become animated and seeing them work multiplicity of jobs, whether it was being a deacon in a church and having to deal with sister so-and-so on Sunday and he would come home and reenact what happened. I was able to see how my family was shamans and shapeshifters. Wow. And able to take that in and also the climate of being um, a young black girl in a southern state that is southern, but um, tropical in a sense. And so those dichotomies of having storytellers, of having people having to maneuver because of political correctness, having that southern sensibility mm. allowed me to become a storyteller and then lended me to finding a voice of how can I chronicalize this? Because these aren't people who are going to write um, their experiences down. Um, it led me to defining what a multi-hyphenate is from people who existed in a duplicity of, of worlds and just uh, crafting that into being an artist uh, kind of inspired me. And um, just having a Jamaican and Afro-Caribbean, um, Afro-Cuban background with my grandmother, I was just reared on, on stories and principles and women who just had like, not just three jobs, but also took care of the community. Mm where everyone everyone in Patrick City knew Moon. That was like everyone called my grandmother Moon. And so it, it was um, a collective sense of being multi-hyphenate and then me having the blessing to record their stories and become an actor and then add on to that. I think it's beautiful because ultimately what I hear is that we came from people who had endless dreams and knew that there was endless possibilities and didn't allow labels and categories to limit them in their, in their focus to achieve a goal. And absolutely your piece, Wade in the Water, that was one of the award winners for the Hear Her Call Caribbean American Festival, showed us your shapeshifter, your, your ancestors spoke right through you. So that's so beautiful to hear that your parents inspired you to awaken to that side of yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, multi-hyphenates, you know, as a Haitian American, as just like everyone else, constantly trying to challenge yourself to know what it means to be yourself in an American society. And constantly as the person who broke the mold and didn't go with the doctor, lawyer, engineer path, that really just pushed me to just constantly say, well, if I'm going to redefine myself, I'm going to constantly do it. And it's beautiful. Thank you so much. So I'm getting a note, Magali, we're just going to take a quick 10 second break because we're going to yeah. try to reset our audio here. And then I'm going wow. to come back because I want to build on the conversation that we're having. So. Thank you for sticking around. And oh, by the way, if it freezes again, just hit reset. 
what is it? Was it the reset refresh. button? Refresh, <laughs> reset, re something. Yeah. Just yeah. redo it. Re Just hit the refresh circle thing, and <laughs> you'll be right back on cue with us. And Sergey was about to ask an amazing question. And we have some feedback from our audience, and it seems like everybody's loving what we're doing. And I'm loving it. We're pivoting. very positive. It's fantastic. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to keep building because Tanya and Monique have, have set us up because I wanted to allow everybody to keep building on that, that, that. So the roots that everyone is coming from to share with us some stories about how that enters your practice and how that enters your work. So, you know, from, from these models that your families presented of wearing many hats, always pushing, always excelling to, to share with us about how you live that, how you honor that. Well, for me, I, um, you know, as artists, especially when things are slow, sometimes we're, you know, we, we get complacent and it's just like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not working right now, so whatever, right? Um, for me, I've, I've adapted this, this philosophy that everyone else in the world besides artists, they tend to have a nine to five job, right? So what if I pretended that I had a nine to five job and I, I work, so I set up a schedule of like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna work on this today. If I have an audition, then that takes up the whole day, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> but if I don't have an audition, then what am I working on? How am I, am I promoting myself? Am I writing something? Am I, so I, I, I set out a schedule. I mean, generally it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not working every single day, but for the most part, I have a schedule as if I were someone who had a full-time job because, because being in the industry, it is a full-time job. And I feel like if we are to excel in this industry that we should treat it that way. So that's my little nugget. I love it. I love it. Thank you. I love that nugget. I, I same. I'm, you know, uh, I, I have a schedule too. Um, sometimes I don't really stick to it. Um, but I also build in, um, a lot of, um, a lot of self care, uh, especially now. Um, I find that with this whole, with the, with the whole pandemic, I have been able to actually, um, get to my meditation practice, um, which is just as important as um, working on um, my many different projects that I have um, that I have been doing and things that I have put off for years like oh I can actually learn Spanish with my grandmother <laughs> and that is something that I have been wanting to do forever and I just didn't give myself the time and now I have no excuse. And she reminds me of that every day, but it's given me the opportunity to really connect with her in a different way. Um, and, um, and I've actually written um, several different plays with her as one of my main characters and essence of her. And now I'm, I'm finding that that is the connection point between being um, the, the creative artist in me is really just living and being able to connect with her and then that's transforming my work. Beautiful, beautiful. So we have had this moment in history that has taken us through a loop since March, right? And it's still taking us through a loop. So it sounds like for you, Juliet, and you, Tanya, your practice, ha your practice of self-care, your practice of working every day on your craft has helped you get through this is th this period or has it informed your approach to this period is, is that what you're sharing it, for me it has not stopped like it's like just because we're having a pandemic um that didn't give me the excuse to, and this is just who i am and sometimes yeah. i need balance sometimes i need to force myself to have that balance um but it still it hasn't stopped me like i performed one of my shows in live stream performance uh in June and I'm about to perform another one next week. So I, I still keep going it, and, yeah. and it, what's going on now has informed my work in a, in a major way. So it's like we artists, that's, that's what we do. We respond to what's going on in our world. Right. And so 
that this is the perfect opportunity to do that. Have you felt that for yourself, Evan, that you've, your practice, did you have a practice that was influenced by your upbringing and how to be an artist and has the, this period of six months reinforced it or affected well, it was, in a different way? It's funny, this period of six months, uh, I've talked to some artists, but I'm gonna talk about myself obviously, but and in some ways it's been a way to step back and build some infrastructure. We didn't have the time to build um, when things were constantly going. And so um, outside of, of course, uh, the, the health challenges, I've had some friends who thankfully got through COVID, a, a good friend of mine is dealing with it now. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, COVID is a, is a real thing, uh, is a real, um, um, a real threat, um, uh, particularly, you know, when you are, your health is already vulnerable. But I think that outside of that, on the positive end, you know, I, I, this time has been actually really good for me um, in terms of building infrastructure, in terms of stepping back and getting more clarity on, on for me, for me, I think, and Magali, you know me a long time. For me, I think, and this goes to the high, multi-hyphen uh, um, designation. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's about staying on mission. I think uh, a lot of that multi-hyphen for me is, is about, I see it like as a portfolio that's actually focused on one specific mission. Yeah. And that now, for me, I never could say that maybe 15 years ago, right? But maybe 10 years ago, I had inkling. There's you know, those times in your life where you, you kind of look scattered to everybody else, but you know, you know, you know that there's something brewing. You know that there's a method to the madness and it, and you have to flesh some things out. And for me, I was able to thankfully do that uh, maybe at least a year or two before the pandemic. And the pandemic's allowed me to really um, be clear and be on mission. So, um, you know, of course I wanted to be over, you know, but but I've been able to, like I say, use this time to build infrastructure in, I guess what you call my practice, that, that has a lot of different um, levels. There's a spiritual self-care, obviously. Um, you know, for a while, I think I wasn't doing the physical self care, and then uh, <laughs> and I got the scare of the doctor. I was like, "Oh, no, that's not gonna work." <laughs> got myself a Fitbit and started grinding it out. You know, so, so for me, it's like, 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 I think that I tried to, uh, and I typically am a, a, a pretty positive person. Uh, you know me a long time. I tend to stay positive. We all have our moments, but I've been able to use this time. Uh, to build some infrastructure. I know other people who have. People have set up voiceover studios in their home, you know, got their, uh, got their pandemic checks, got state-of-the-art uh, state equipment now I didn't have before. And it's, it's great. I think it's great. Exactly, right, Tony? Like, yeah, it's great. So now, that's, now, that's now, an entrepreneurial now, approach to right, it. Now we're coming out of this pandemic with guns blazing, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And so, and so, 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 so for me, it's a blessing to have some infrastructure set up that I didn't have before, and um, you know, and I'm, and I'm steady gonna keep doing it until, till, till the doors open again. I'm, by the way, I'm still gonna wear masks a year from now, so I'm, gonna, you know. You know what? It's like I'm serious. It's, I don't know if I can ever go out without that mask. <laughs> That's right. Either that, or I'm just like, you know, put the head wrap. You know, put the the, the <laughs> head wrap, and you'll just assume I have a different religious affiliation, and I don't yeah. care. I don't uh -huh. care, Monique. Um, I would say that during this time of the pandemic and the of COVID nineteen and the epidemic of racism yes. that is <laughs> within our country right now, I would say that um, this time has yes, this informed my artistry as a multi hyphenated, and it has allowed me to become very serious about the business of living, which is sometimes um, taking for granted with the work. There's so many things that we tend to sacrifice for the career or the business that we say, okay, I won't do this. I'll just hold on to this. And when I pop or when this happens, I'll be able to mm -hmm. participate in that. And we've missed the birthdays or the weddings and we've yeah. missed so many things. Um, and this has allowed me to really get, uh, and I just spoke about on mission, but like really to get serious about calling and purpose 
and really defining who is, um, what is the mission and what communities am I here to, to elevate? What communities I'm here to not be their voice, but to magnify their voice because, because they have their own voice. It's, not, it's just, it's my duty to get off of that support. So during this time, I have been able to, because I couldn't, with everything that was going on, get to that, that still place, that quiet place where you're able to sit and commune with, with for me, it's God, but with the divine to really go, okay, you got all of these gifts, all these dope things. You say you want to write, you want to produce. Okay, that's great. So what are we doing with this right now in this moment? And how are we healing yourself in this quiet time? And how are we offering healing um, as we go through this? And so it's really been able to have me focus, to get very specific about mission and about goal. And once I get clarity on that, which I'm getting, sure i can do any audition and whatever but also knowing that i'm operating on a larger purpose mm, yes so this, so this time has allowed me to become purposeful and self-full so i can be that that um that conduit or that multi-hyphenated for my community and those communities who need me so it's the moment of going within which is giving mm -hmm. the clarity at least in my journey and I'm sure in everyone's journey, we have to go within because we we can't go without. We can't go outside, you know? Um, so we have to go within and the awakenings that are coming forth uh, are about uh, the betterment of the world. You were saying, Evan? Yeah, I just wanna add something to um, uh, Monique said. Uh, definitely um, uh, two things. Not, I don't wanna take away that there's some things that have been definitely odd during the pandemic, you know? Um, as far as like, I don't know if people lost family members during this time, but those, those virtual funerals were, were, um, those, are those are just different. Yeah. Um, but also one of the things that this time revealed, uh, is I remember, um, I'm actually, uh, uh working with a church plan called kinetic, kinetic New York .org. I know. <laughs> Go ahead. I want to hear it. Kinetic. How and, do you spell uh, that? And, How do you spell and, that? And, kinetic and, as in uh, kinetic? Kinetic, kineticnewyork.org. Kinetic okay. Um, okay. And uh, the founder and leader of it, Cedric Johnson, and I were talking, Cedric Johnson and I were talking, and he said, you know, what is it, we were talking about what is it people need now, and there's a common thread, you know, everybody, no matter rich, no matter poor, at this time, even if you had positive attitude, there's moments when the most positive people didn't feel so positive, but everybody had that common thread in need of hope, right? Everybody had that. Everybody had that at some point. And so we were talking about, I said, man, you know, the only thing I can think of that everybody needs is that. Um, and, um, and he agreed. So we are constantly trying to find ways to meet that need. But that need not, doesn't, is not just a pandemic need. I think it, the, the pandemic itself just um, magnified that need in humanity, whether rich or poor. You know, I, know, we have, I don't know about anybody else, but I have friends who kind of run the gamut in the economic spectrum. And it, everybody was concerned, you know. Uh, there were people who, and not to get into um, politics of this, but there were people who were poor who, who said they're not taking the vaccine. And there were people who were rich who said they're not taking the vaccine. So I'm like, okay. Well, you know, so it's just interesting when you get all those perspectives, right. you know. And, uh, but hope is a, was a, uh, there's a truck making noise. But hope is a common thread for everybody, no matter your socioeconomic status, no matter your race or ethnicity. Can you type in the name of the um, ministry? Because oh. someone in the audience would like to know how to yeah. access that information. Thank you so much. So you've already mentioned your parents were instrumental. Was there a mentor or mentee along in your journey that like when the light on being a multi-hyphenate dimmed helped stoke it or when you didn't know that there was a light for my time, when you forgot it because you're focused on being an actor. Because there's a stage when we all focus on being an actor, right? It's like, I want to be an actor, and that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to put it all into that. And then all of a sudden you realize, like Juliet said, there, there are downtimes, right? And, you know, that residual check comes in, and then it stops. And then you, you feel depleted, and you need to do... So was there someone that said, let me be your mentor, let me be your example? And if not, have you found people that you want to men 
mentor yourself because you feel that this the spark to be a multi-hyphenate is the ultimate spark for an artist. Anybody want to share on that? Or maybe you're just, you know, self-realized thanks to your parents and you're rocking. <laughs> and everybody watching this will, you know, look up to you and like go and tag you on Facebook and say, I want to get to know you. Uh, so I'll speak to that. I, um, I've had some mentors in my life, not necessarily multi-hyphenate artists, but, um, but I, but I mentor artists in creating their own solo show, as you know, mm -hmm. exactly. and, um, and, and a, a lot of it has to do with empowering them to know that they don't have to sit and wait for the phone to ring yeah. that they can create their mm -hmm. own uh product because that's what essentially it does become after you create a show it's a product that you can then use to make money you know and and turn it into other things i mean you can start out a solo show and turn it into a tv show or a film or whatever yeah. and so that so that's that kind of starts the path of at least having more than one title because now you're not only an actor, you're an, a writer now. And lots of times solo artists then end up having to produce, <laughs> you know, and do the whole thing themselves. So, um, so that's kind of a little bit about my journey. I did, you know, my writing mentor when I first did my first solo show was um, it, Reggie Rock Bythewood, who Magalie, you know as well. And, um, and so, he was very instrumental in in helping and guiding me in in writing the show and um, and so yeah i remember when evan and i we both went to yale together i saw roger guinevere smith's show and i was hmm. like i gotta do a one-person show i gotta graduate with a one-person show because while I was at Yale, we had the cabaret, which is a space where students get to produce their own work. So I was writing, and Evan was actually <laughs> in one of my plays. I directed you one. I directed you one. You directed me in one, and you were in Great one of play. mine. You played opposite Cheryl Aronson. Aronson. Oh, yeah, no, I was girl. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah, girl. yeah. Yeah. And um, so I was like, I can't graduate without a one-person show because, you know, Yale did not hide the fact that I was black for my casting. So I was like, if the real world's going to be like this, I better have a one-person show so I can keep busy when I get out of here. And um, yeah, that was really powerful. And before I got there, I saw Regina Taylor's play Watermelon Rhine, and I didn't know an actor could write a play. Mm -hmm. I was like, she's an actor. I saw her on TV and she wrote a play? And it was really good. So it was like constant wakings by people of color saying, you got to do your stuff. Do your stuff. And don't just wait for people to do stuff for you to be in. And mm. finally, as far as sh doing short films, Jackie Alexander, who's the artistic director of the National Black Theater, I saw his film in a festival and he was in it. And he wrote it. And he directed it. And he, I was like, okay, how do you do that? <laughs> you know? He's like, you can do it too. That's all I need to hear. You can do it too. I'm like, yeah. So I, I, I don't. I, I was going to say, it comes full circle because when you, I, I want to bring, I want to big you up a little bit here because um, when you came to us with AHA Moments, I had really? never produced, you know, because I, what we produced, I co-wrote a piece and I acted in a piece in this in this whole production. And that was the first time that I did all three of those in I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. So so you you inspired me, Magali, by the way. Just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yep. We did Thank yeah. You. When I lived in Los Angeles, I met Juliet at a fundraiser and fell in love with her. I was like, you got to produce something with me. And she's like, okay. I was like, it was Reggie Rock, Rock, Reggie Rock Blythewood's fundraiser. Mm. And we were working as volunteers there and yeah. her spirit was so magnificent. I was looking to form a production team and I was like, I love your spirit. Do you want to produce with me? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is going to be good. And we built up a team and we did a festival of one act plays by women. And 
it, it was plays about transformation, and I never knew that was the first time you produced. <laughs> that was my first time producing. Oh yep. my gosh! <laughs> Look what you started, girl. <laughs> 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 Anyone else want to share their stories about people that set the fire off for them? You know, I think because I didn't, I didn't have mentors. I, I had, um, I had people who would cast me in things. And then when I wanted to do other things, um, I got a lot of no's. And I think through that, that was the fire that really made me go, okay, well, you don't want me to do a solo show. I'm going to do it. You don't want me to make a films because I'm only supposed to be an actress. I'm going to make films. Mm -hmm. And I think through that and that journey, um, that very crazy, rocky journey. And it was my basically just being like, you're telling me, no, I'm going to say yes to myself. And once I started that is when I started creating a community of people who were my mentors and peers. And there was just this like, um, back and forth of skill sharing and every now and again I go oh you know my mom was my mentor my father was my mentor um, my high school drama teacher was my mentor um, uh, Bonnie Gillespie when I um, moved out to LA was my mentor and then now is I feel is like I'm in my peer circle and um, the fluidity of that really made me feel like oh there's something that I, in my head, thought of what mentor was supposed to be, and it was nothing that happened. And I really enjoy that there is something to level the playing field of what a mentor and mentee means, because mm. I now give and share when somebody comes to me and, you know, I, I give them what I can, and then I see them do that ripple effect and I think about decolonizing what we know as the hierarchy of what entertainment is. Mm. And that mentor-mentee really bothered me for a long time because, because I couldn't find one. Or when I would pick a mentor, they would show their ugly colors. And, and it was just not uh, a place I needed to be in. But once I allowed it to go ahead and say, I can make my own. I can be creatively... Um, uh, independent of what I thought what mentorship was and a whole world opened up and I ask that of people a lot I'm like how can we both be the mentor and the mentee at the same time exactly that's the ideal relationship that's the ideal relationship because otherwise somebody gets sucked dry right, right. and life is about reciprocity so when, when I talk about these people who influenced me by being the most magnificent self, they sparked me, you know, and my fear of asking, you know, for help mean, meant I just watched and sniffed them in and be like, okay, you're awesome. I want to be like you, you know, I'm just going to watch you and repeat, you know, and try to be on the down low so you don't know I'm watching you, you know, but I will always honor them and say, because I watched you, because you let me watch you, even if you didn't know I was watching you, you changed my life. Every time you did something new, I'm like, I can do that. Every time you did something new, I can do that. It's not so much when nothing, it's like doorways. And sometimes we need someone to show that there is a door. Mm, not all yeah. of us are able to just imagine a door and walk through it. Those who are, they're the blessed ones. And they, mm. you know, they pave pathways. But sometimes we just, you, just one door opening allows us to open doors for ourselves, which then lets somebody say, oh, that's a door. I'm going to go through that door too. So just, it's a domino effect, you know? Yeah. But yeah, the healthiest relationships when, when I, you know, quote unquote, take someone under my wing is when I don't expect anything from it and they don't expect anything from it. I just have faith. I have faith in your magnificence and leave it at that, you know? And then building on that point, Magali, and, and Tanya's point, um, especially something that's happened in the last six months. And I, I can speak to what I see, which is here on the East Coast. So folks on the West Coast, please help me contextualize this. But something that happened was all the gatekeepers lost the keys because all the gates closed. Like <laughs> all the gates were closed. So, you know, that the, the people who were allowing admission lost their juice. For, mm, mm. And there was this scramble and this panic and this freeze because we all didn't want to die 
And what I've seen, especially in the last 60 to 90 days, is this explosion of people who, and I think it's a lot of the, the same impulse of everybody who's in this conversation right now, of I have something to do, I have something I want to say. And now there is a platform and the, the field is level. Everybody's home. And if you have internet, like I need storytelling. I need someone to talk to me. And we are seeing just people who are not getting the stage, getting the mic and getting the floor. Mm. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeing with here in the East, you know, people who are, are self-producing and presenting. Um, and something that we've asked a few times in our different chats here is we keep asking, and so I'm going to ask you guys, because I think you guys have the best answer for this. Like, can we go back to the framework before? You know, all those people who said no to you, Tanya, before, like, are they going to be, is anyone asking them the question on the other side of this? Are we asking permission anymore? I'm not. I'm not asking permission. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I don't think I was before. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm not either. I, and the, the little bit of, of that, that, I always tell people I'm becoming more like my mother, being the Rebecca Park. May she rest her soul. May, may God rest her. May she rest in peace. Man, my mother was, uh, she didn't ask permission, man. My father was a diplomat. Uh, but my mother, I'm like, wow, I'm coming more like my mother, which I'm very happy about, actually. You know, because I feel like this time in my life, I need to be more like my mother. <laughs> so, um, yeah, similar to Tanya, I had very similar experience. So, uh, just, um, I, have, I have certain opinions about the mentorship thing. I, I definitely, particularly from, in, in relation to sort of experiences I've had, but um, in, in the arts, but I've, the mentorship I've received is more and more like outside the arts, like, you know, in sort of faith leadership stuff, uh, more so in the arts. It's, a, it's been particularly I found, and I thought it was just me, but I talked to other of my peers, and I found like the generation before me, uh, uh, particularly, specifically black men, they didn't do much of that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with the other artists. And, and I thought it was just me. And when I talked, asked around, I was like, okay. I don't know what that is. Um, they, I, their generation probably went through it in a way that we're like, you know, some, we just, we just, you just got to work it out. Um, so I'm very de deliberate and intentional about, um, uh, there's a couple of young guys. One, I worked for a period of time. I helped so a mentor. He's a, uh, for mentor actually through a process. He's a SUNY purchased another a young man who's a filmmaker, um, came out of a Yale undergrad, great kid too, both great kids. Um, and he's going to do, he's going to do phenomenal. Uh, he's, he's, work, he's, he's working right now with Ken Burns, yeah. um, by familiar Ken Burns. Yeah. He just got out of school. He's working with Ken Burns. So, That's so and he knows I'm, his name's Clark Burnett. He knows that he's a bit, him and him and Spencer are both available to call me whenever. So and they're both young, young black men. And when the opportunity came, I said, you know, some, uh, when the, the relation, the, the guys who are my age weren't really the black men who are my age in the arts weren't really doing this for me. So I wanted, I didn't want them to have that experience. Uh, so of course during the pandemic, we haven't done any of that. Um, he just, Clark's film just got into, I've got one film uh, festival. He just sent me a short film. He won the Milo's Foreman Award at Yale for uh, oh, some, wow. I think the best. And I'm in the shorts called Atho Park. I'm, I'm not, it's not a plug. I'm just saying, if you have to look them up, Spell it. Type it into this so we can put it into the chat. <laughs> Type it in. It's not a plug. I just, I just wanted to tell you to watch the shit. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So hopefully they're watching this now. But um, you know, good, good kids. Um, but yeah, mentorship. I just wanted to be intentional and do different with the, uh, if the, the kids who were, who are willing to be responsible. You know, what I mean, you just can't mentor everybody. Yeah. And people, the the certain uh, kids who they didn't show up when you say show up and then you, you got too much to do the older you get you can't really can't hold everybody's hand but the right. kids too hungry and wanted an opportunity and wanted to have a listening ear i was available for what about you monique uh yeah i would say that i had non-traditional mentors outside of the industry i did have people who um Put up with my awkward and craziness in undergrad. God bless Andrea Harrison, who's an amazing um, actor, writer, professor, um, one of the few African American women who's a, a 
successful writer in the sci-fi genre. Um, mm. uh, uh, this awkward girl who was just so shy to talk to her because I thought she was amazing and I would just hang around in class. Like everyone would leave and I would just be there looking at her. <laughs> and she was like, hi, Monique. I'm like, hi. <laughs> and so she took me under her wing and um, throughout the years checks on me and, and it's just, I can always go back and talk to her whenever things are just obscure and she's just this beautiful woman. And I would also say I've been very blessed to have peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Mm. Um, I am very blessed to be surrounded by a tribe who um, there is no competition. It, it is really about um, we got next and it's a beautiful in that where if it's not my brother who is my low key manager and promoting me every time and who has never missed a performance, whether it's wherever it is in the region and my family to Khalid Troy and my partner who, and my classmates um, who um, Carl Kennedy, who always say that Monique, you are what you've been waiting for. And then there were times when I'm like, no, I, I got to get this role. It's awkward. I, really awkward I can't write this and everyone has been like you have to write you have to write and so having friends who when I'm like okay guys I have this short film idea and friends who are like okay here's the money go do it and I'm like what <laughs> here's the money <laughs> and and so friends who really believe in my vision who in whatever arena they're in who have steered me to champion my unique experience my voices my awkwardness um my not getting social cues uh, to 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 write. I'm very blessed to have peer to peer mentorship, where Issa Rae talks about net reaching across and networking. Mm, across. Mm. I'm really blessed that I'm I'm with artists who really are like Monique. I never got to work on this role. People don't see me as this. I go, okay, I'll write it. Let's see how we can film this and get this work done. And I've been able to build a community, a production company, from being guided, mentored, prayed for, and championed by peers. So I'm, I'm very, very blessed to have that. So it sounds like you're inspired by your peers more so oh, yeah. than some we, artists we, on we, the outside. We, yeah, beautiful. Anybody else want to share the people who inspire them other than their parents? <laughs> Are the artists you mean? Or yeah, yeah, well, art, artists the artists that have inspired you. I mean, I could say that as a writer, um, Paul Carter Harrison, his understanding of magical realism inspired me. And I had the blessing to meet him when I li lived in Chicago in the 90s. And for many years, he would check in and I'd share my work with him and he'd give me honest feedback. Uh, that's as a writer and as an actor, Michelle Shea, just seeing her journey. And then I found out recently she's a Capricorn. I'm like, no wonder, no wonder, because I'm a Capricorn. No wonder I latched onto you the first moment I met you back in the 90s, because you were a Capricorn. And, you know, she, she must have thought I was cray cray on a cracker, but I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> what am I from a distance? You're awesome. <laughs> Watchers. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are my inspirations of, you know, because they set the example for me, you know. And I, I, I tend to look towards the, 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 the mature generation, you know, I do, my peers inspire me, but I, I believe in elders. I'm kind of like that way. I believe in elders and looking towards them. Anyone want to share elders or not? It's okay. I mean, my elders are, are also in my peer group too. I mean, I know yeah. right now it's really um, giving me um, life as a writer is, um, uh, tapping in with the Latinx Playwright Circle in New York, a um, whole host of um, amazing, amazing people. And in, in, not only that is that, you know, there is, uh, there's a constant dialogue. So even, um, even when it's, we, you know, there's the, they, they meet on Sundays um, and everyone can jump in every week or when they can bringing their work. Um, but there's also dance parties and um, a real, you know, Monique talked about tribe there. There's a real tribe um, element to it where we're, mm -hmm. you know, Friday nights, you know, we are a full on, you know, breaking a sweat 
um, <laughs> dancing for hours. And then there's mm. daily, you know, check-ins and just, you know, and then there's something really um, juicy about it that for me is really making me go, oh, this is, you know, I'm championing for every single artist in here when, um, you know, they have a reading or they're, you know, they're, you know, winning awards or, you know, having a question about, you know, how they're going to, how they're going to go from one state to the next. Those are the things that are making me um, really looking, looking forward to making more art yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, and there's also the Brown Girl Doc Mafia. Um, Brown Girls Doc Mafia uh, is a is a an amazing collective of filmmakers who I feel are changing the landscape and um, and just showing the visibility and the possibility of championing for storytelling um, in the doc world. Beautiful. And those two groups, you know, it's like I I, I mean there's so many people in those groups that every day I get to wake up and I feel inspired. Can you enter that into the chat so that we can share that with the audience? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So what do you, I mean, you all have your own companies. So what are you putting out? I know that you mentioned an event, Juliet. So. Yeah. So I'll talk about that. Um, I am curating a solo show theater festival um, entitled Black Voices. And it's um, working with Brian Rasmussen over at the Wi Fi Theater here in LA. And, but it's all going to be live streamed. So anyone in the world can see these shows. So you're going to type in the website so that we I'll, can share I'll it with the that, audience? Yeah. Awesome. And, and then my, my, my show specifically, Judgment Day, is going to premiere the, um, the fest, open the festival on September 12th, so next week, Saturday. And that really deals with, um, it's a piece where I question God, um, mm. for all of the injustices that have happened to black people over the years. So it gets really intense, but, um, but there's light moments in there too. So I would love for you guys to check that out. And Please so I'll send us the, yeah, add yeah. that in there. Monique. I have, um, uh, three projects right now that I'm really excited about. I currently am. I'm sorry, Monique. Khalif Troy Khalif is sending you so many hearts. <laughs> He's sending you mad hearts. Okay, I cannot let this go. He gave you major props <laughs> in the beginning. He asked you. Enthusiastic. And, you know, I've got to like give him his props. He's like giving you so much love. Thank you. Well, he is one of the, um, actually my co-producer. We just finished producing um, a virtual play called Unapologetically Black, written by the amazing playwright Etoro Bassi. Uh, she is turning unapologetically. Your, your video froze. Oh, yeah. she froze so, up. Circle back for the rest yeah, of the we'll story. Yeah, we'll circle back. Okay, um, Evan, she's, yeah, she can't, she's. Uh, okay. uh, what I'm doing now, well, it's funny, um, just uh, as I said, as far as artist-wise, focused on this, I have one, two, three great uh, writers, screen writers I'm working with, so I would like to uh, get one of their projects done uh, within the year, one of these three projects done within the year, so um, I'm, I'm in the process of, of uh, and matter of fact, partnering with experienced producer, uh, hopefully, you know, you have to wait to, to see how things turn out and then raising some money to, to do those. So that's something I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, a lot of that for me is about uh, sort of the next stage of my career. We talk about this, just uh, yeah. uh, doing, doing less in front of the camera and really just uh, being able to do more behind. And uh, it's something I've always want to do even like in the at the height of me doing things behind camera i remember i was doing a film uh and, and we were in new zealand and man it was one of the best experience i ever had we were in new zealand for seven months it was king kong and um i remember thinking to myself this is great but who's the guy who put this together <laughs> <laughs> So I said, let me, so I have more of sort of a passion for that side. 
and yeah. I can under, and I understand why it, now that I'm older why it makes more sense it makes more sense for me to be doing it now for a lot of reasons I think you know, uh, maturity is one of them uh, and, but I think uh, yeah I, that's that's a dream of mine so I'm, I'm working that's I guess among other things because like I like, like like I said like we know a multi hyphenate my God, <laughs> man. well share the websites for all the stuff that you're involved with definitely so that we well right now I have a, a landing page for what's going to be the website which is Amethyst Media Amethyst Media dot com I'll type it in um and uh and uh, Amethyst Media Capital was the handle on um on Instagram. But right now, like I said, it's a landing page until we get some projects uh, legally set up right. uh, in the way I want them to, and then we'll, we'll promote it on there. But you can you can join our mailing list, so I'll put it in okay. the, uh, the chat. Monique, we lost you, but now you're back. You're back. You're back. Okay, let me speak quickly before I go again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am co-producing uh, with Colleen Troy, um, Unapologetically Black, which is written by Itoro Bassi, who is a Nigerian-American playwright. Right now, she's currently in Nigeria, and she's working on a 10-play cycle. Wow. And Unapologetically Black deals with um, allyship and what does that look like? And is there such thing as allyship? Um, and it's uh, the focal point is from a Black woman's perspective. Um, and it's brilliant. She's brilliant, and she's turning it into a play, Zoom play series, right? Which is where we are. You spoke about keys and having access, so taking right. power into our own, own hands. Second thing I'm working on is a feature film called Two Wings um, that looks at our ancestral relationship to death um, in the diaspora. Um, hmm. And the last thing is next week I will be teaching a three-day workshop called... <laughs> Shameless plug. It's time for a That's not life. shameless. Thank What's you. the humbleness? People, Thank don't you. be humble. Okay? Thank you. Enter the information about your workshop. Please well, enter it so that we can share it. We'll put it down there. Three-day workshop um, on the art of producing, the business of being an actor, and booking the room. Beautiful. So, okay. so you're producing this movie. I am producing um, the feature film, and I am uh, co-writing. Beautiful. Tanya? I know. It's so many things. <laughs> I thought, How do you choose I, one? I know. I was like, I thought, you know, a couple months ago, I was like, I'm going to do a, um, a creative incubation and not really take on too many projects and just get one with myself. And I, and I did that, but I also, it inspired me to do so many things. So on the acting front, I'm doing, um, I'm working with a, a company, Honest Accomplice uh, Theater, which we are devising something that's going to go up in October, um, which is really exciting because we're exploring um, how to, make something in zoom and break the form um hmm. so we'll see <laughs> it's really it's That's a really fun yeah it's a really great collaboration with um about 20 artists um i was doing uh sketch comedy with the homemade sketch show that was born out of the pandemic and that will have some very exciting news we're launching on a new um channel and um, and we're taking a break right now to rev up and make all the comedy and then go forth on this channel. <laughs> okay. Which I will I will announce all of this uh, when I'm uh, when I uh, when I can. Okay, and so follow Tanya if you want to know. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's just like Tanya on um, Instagram and Twitter is uh, Tanya Perez Rules with a Z. Um, and my last thing is a, um, a friend who does, who passed away during the pandemic and, um, she gave me her, um, her company who I've, I was working with her for many, many years. We've known each other for over almost three decades and, um, and I'm taking on her legacy and I, um, and I will be doing play and play devising with her company called Creatively Independent, um, which I'm um, really excited to uh, to start doing that sometime this fall. 
Um, and I'll, and I'll put that as well in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you. So, you know, Sergey, you and I, we've been asking questions. So what are you doing, Sergey? Cause you're so busy. I can barely get you on the phone. So <laughs> what are you doing? What are what you doing? doing? Um, so uh, one of the other companies I'm, I'm resident playwright for, we've been doing, um, I've been commissioned on multiple plays and I've been approaching different things. So, so two years ago, I did a play for them about, um, environmental justice and how uh, uh, populations of color are uniquely vulnerable to mm. pollution and degradation. We presented that a couple years ago. And uh, so for Quicksilver Theater Company, um, I'm working on a new play with them called Mind's Eye, where we're looking at mental health uh, in the black community and how um, we either do or do not discuss it. Um, and so I'm in the third draft of that and we were going to be presenting it and of course like everything else it's come to a come to a halt at the moment so right. um, i'm using it as my opportunity to do some frantic redrafts while no one's looking because no one needs any pages so i can do whatever i want on it um that's Beautiful. the current project so it doesn't look like we have any questions from my audience we do have amazing a lot of love a lot of love yvette gagne has love been with audience. us and she's yeah. sending a lot of heart i already told you about khalif he's big heart and um, let's see who else has been pipe saying hello to us. Uh, Hillary Cohen, a wonderful woman that I've met thanks to ART New York. And uh, she's joined us today. And that's all I see has been typed in. Anything else, yeah. Veronica? Nothing else. Well, you know, oh, what am I doing? Okay, I want to tell you about me. Uh, Conch Shell Productions, if you've been following us, we are coming out with two writing workshops. And um, one writing workshop is a work in progress workshop for people if you're working on a project and you're just kind of stuck and you just need to be in a room with other writers and with an amazing teacher. Well, Cassandra Madley is that amazing teacher and she'll be leading that workshop and helping you realize your vision. And if you don't have something written, but you're like, been going within and you're inspired to do something but you don't know what that thing is that's also a great space for you to come and write it's a 10-week workshop go to our website conchelleproductions.com to learn more and sergey is going to be leading another workshop i'll let him speak for himself about that workshop um well this is going to be a workshop where we're examining the nature of storytelling and my obsession as i brought it up here is the idea that how we tell stories is completely opened up and completely changing. Mm. And I want to run with that idea. And instead of trying to run back and pour our stories into the same vessels that have existed, if anyone's interested, I want to sit around and talk about how we tell stories differently and what we want to learn moving forward. And speaking of telling stories, we're doing the fall installment of the Blue Light series. And so we're accepting submissions of 10 to 30 minute plays and um, go to our website and submit. And the topic, the, the genre is comedy. Hello, Tanya, wake up, I'm talking to you, okay. <laughs> the genre is comedy and there are all kinds of comedy. And, um, you know, send us your stuff. Uh, the Blue Light series was amazing in the spring and it's gonna be even more amazing in the fall. And I'm super excited to be co-producing with HB Studios all over again. And we're gonna end with quotes. I want, if anybody has a favorite quote they want to share, hit us with it. Well, okay. So I, I was, I participated in, a um, a empowerment weekend for the LA Women's Theater Festival last weekend. And I facilitated a couple of workshops. It was on the panel. And as I was saying things, I was like, Ooh, that should be a quote. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, write so, that down. Make an Instagram post out of that I one. Know, I know. So I did. I'm sure you saw. So the so one is, I'm an artist. I cannot be stopped. And another is, an actor's job is to heal and inspire. And lastly, I'll share, and this wasn't mine. This is something that was shared with um, Adila. In response to the pandemic, uh, somebody said to her, actors are first responders. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes. Yes. We are. We are. We're essential. I mean, I mean, I spent so many years in my 20s and 30s wondering if I was essential. Even in my 40s, I woke up. I woke up. I'm like, I am so super essential. 
Mm. The fact that people binging on Netflix and YouTube. Oh, Netflix. I have a, I'm a, a recurring. I have a recurring role in a new net, Netflix show that's coming out in October called Grand really? Army. I'm so pumped. Let me tell you, the script is so freaking amazing. I was like, so, I was just like, <gasps> I was like eating it up like ice cream. And you know, I like ice cream. And the cast is so awesome. I play the mother, uh, the matriarch in this Haitian family. So I get to be a Haitian mother. Yeah. I'm like straight up, yo, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. you, you, you called me. My grandmother and my mother were on set. <laughs> Mainly my mother. They were on set. Not yeah. physically, but their spirit. I was just like, let me just let go and let be them. Because that's what it is. You know what I mean? When your ancestors speak through you, you know you got the role that you need to be doing, right? Oh, yes. So, um, I interrupted someone. Quotes. 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 Yeah. 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 Can you please put that, the person who said actors are our first respondent. Can or it you is. Put that in there. Or 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 I don't I, oh, I got it from Adela Barnes, but she got it from somebody else. So I don't know who the originator of that was. But we we'll, we'll just already. adopt it. We we'll just say love to whoever threw that out there. Actors are first responders. No, artists are first responders. Let's, say artists, Let's add comes, that. Artists are first, not fist, first responders. I love that. Because <laughs> we have been, man. I mean, we have been. I mean, Anybody disagree with me? No, everybody was shaking their head yes. Okay, yeah, so next, other quote. Let me hear this, I love this. I got one that actually, man, if, if there was ever a quote that defines um, uh, where, I'm, where, where, where my life is now and where I, I hope to be heading, and it's funny, I give credit where credit is due. First of all, it's a quote from James Baldwin, who was mm. one of my favorite authors. Um, and then it was quoted, it was tweeted by Dr. Eddie Glau. You familiar with him at all, guys? He's he's uh um he he has a he's on a, he's on I forget what station he's on some show, but he's also a think professor in African American studies, I think at Princeton, uh, and religion in African American studies. I could be wrong, but it was I think it got it came out of his latest book, and it's a quote from James Baldwin, and he says, and I quote, "I would like us to do something unprecedented to create to create ourselves without finding it necessary to create an enemy." You know, and um, that's that's my favorite quote right now. Mm. You know I mean? Beautiful. Type yeah. that in so we can share that. Yeah, oh, that's have, beautiful. Uh, Anyone uh, else has a quote? I have two. Oh, no. You go. You go. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, there's um, one that I always think of with Dr. Maya Angelou is um, bring the people you love with you. Mm. So whatever room you go in. Mm. Everyone who has ever loved, you're not going in alone. You're bringing your grandma, your auntie, your dad, your brother with you into these spaces. And you're never by yourself. Therefore, you don't ever have to feel like you need validation because you have those loved ones with you. And you never question your being because you know who you are. Yeah. So always bring them with you. Yeah. And um, the other quote that's been living with me is, um, don't waste your dash which is um, we're born at a certain time and we die at a certain time and we have that, that dash mark between. So really thinking about how we utilize yeah. that, that dash moment between and we get so caught up in other things. So don't waste your dash. That's beautiful. Thanks. Type that in. I love that. Type all that you said in. It was beautiful. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, really seriously, I, we have so much to offer the world and if they can take our nuggets and breathe it in and eat it and, and, and like drown it into their spirits, then we've had a life well lived, right? And it's our words. It's our words. Mm -hmm. Who else wants to share? I have a... I love Jim Henson. <laughs> okay. And... Um, and... Uh, it, you know, the life of play and the life of puppetry and imagination. Um, and this quote is the uh, life is like a movie, write your own ending, keep believing, keep pretending. I love it. I was watching a documentary, a French documentary, and I don't recall who said it, but it really hurt. It really moved me. I'm going to do it in French and in English. It, 
the quote is, le monde retient son souffle et il compte sur nous tous. And it means the world holds its breath and it counts on, a, on us all. The world holds its breath and it counts on us all. <laughs> Thank you to whoever said that. It, yeah. I just had to type it the moment I heard it. I was like, oh my God, mm. that's it, that's it, that's it. Mm. Sergey, do you want to share a quote? There's no way on top of that, no. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I think it sounds like a great time for right. a closing. <laughs> it's a good time for closing. So thank you to Juliet Jeffers, Evan Park, Tanya Perez, and Monique A. Robinson for joining us tonight. Thank you online for joining us for this installment of Conch Shell Productions Artist Chat. Please be sure to fill out the survey we shared with you in the chat because we want to know more about you. We want to know who's watching, who's talking, who's commenting. And by the way, if you haven't seen our posts, Conshell Productions will be offering two writing workshops, as we, note, as we noted. Um, we want to help elevate your unique voice. And we are currently accepting, as Magali said, short play submissions for Blue Light Series Fall 2020, which we are co-presenting with HB Studios. So to learn more about the workshops, Conshell Productions, and to make a donation to support our coming Blue Light Series Fall 2020, visit our website and follow us on social media. Thank you, everyone. So much love, so much heart, so much blessing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, this is great. <laughs> <laughs>